right? Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with forced convection out of the textbook of Sengel and Gijar. There are four chapters uh, on forced convection. Uh, the first chapter was just chapter six on fundamentals. Chapter seven was on external flow. Chapter eight is the one we are busy with, internal flow. And the next chapter would be natural convection. In this chapter, 8.1, we started with an introduction looking at the difference between internal forced convection and external. And the difference is that in internal forced convection, the two boundary layers may meet. That's the difference. Then we've also looked at the fact that it makes things much easier for us that in heat exchanges, we do not try to look at the local velocities or the local temperatures in general we would be interested in the mean values of temperature and velocity as it moves through a heat exchanger or a tube or any geometry in which we have internal forced convection. Then we've also looked at the entrance lengths for hydrodynamic fully developed flow and thermal boundary, uh, thermal fully developed flow. And then for specifically for laminar flow, we've looked at the two very important cases for constant heat flux and a constant surface temperature. How they differ and the very important information that we can get from them. So in the test or exam or in industry, uh, it is not only about looking at the boundary conditions and let's start doing calculations. You need to think what is happening on the inside because it can really assist you in making the right decisions. Right. Now with yesterday's lecture, we've ended with the following, and that is to look at the two cases of Nusselt number as a function of Reynolds number for fully developed flow for a constant heat flux and a constant wall temperature. We have a certain length before the flow would fully develop, so that is the fully developed flow. And although I've shown LT here, in this case I would assume LH is smaller than LT. Okay, so let's suppose LH is there. So that we can say that the flow is fully developed at that position there. So for the case where we have a constant heat flux, constant heat flux, then the Nusselt number would be equal to 4.36. Very important, only if the flow is fully developed. For a constant wall temperature, constant wall temperature, it would be equal to 3.66. Okay. So it is important that when you have flow through an internal body, a geometry, that you do not immediately look at the flow regime and say it is laminar, and for that reason you choose one of those values. You have to realize you still have this region that you also have to take into consideration. Obviously, if this is very small, then it would be a good assumption to say you can use that value right through the geometry. So. In terms of, uh, yeah, before, okay, let's just look at, we have uh, those two conditions, and we have it, in, and Said, you can go onto the laptop now. Uh, you can, da -da -da. if I can just find it now. Da -da -da. Oh, there you go, there you go, okay. So, In table 8.1, as you can see, what we have here is different geometries. Okay, we can see the circular tube, a rectangle, a rectangle, a ellipse, and a triangle. And different aspect ratios, if it is important, but then there, the Nusselt number for the two cases. TS is the constant surface temperature, and QS is the constant heat flux. So for constant surface temperature, 3.66, uh, 
and the constant heat flux 4.36 and the friction factor we are also normally interested in would be equal to 64 divided by the Reynolds number. And then for other geometries, the other values are given. Okay. So it also depends on the geometry. Okay. So take note of that and very importantly there in terms of the fine print, the, also the hydraulic diameter which is taken into consideration with some of these calculations depending on the geometry. Right, now as I've said unfortunately life is not that easy that you're going to have only applications where you're going to have that. So we also need equations that can describe what is happening when the flow is developing. And one of them is going to be uh, the equation. Sorry, no, the equation of Edwards. Okay, so Edwards, the Edwards equation of 1979, of 90, yeah, 1979, looks like this. The Nusselt number is equal to 3.66 plus 0.065 multiplied by D divided by L multiplied by Reynolds and Prandtl divided by 1 plus 0.4 times multiplied by D divided by L again multiplied by Reynolds Prandtl and everything to the two thirds and that is equation 862 in your textbook and take note very importantly this is for a constant wall temperature the Nusselt number for the constant wall temperature so this part can be described by equation 862 okay and there's the equation and as you can see you have 3.66 plus something it means the Nusselt number will always be larger than 3.66 and as the diameter divided by length ratio is getting smaller and smaller means that the tube is getting longer and longer okay. then this would become smaller and smaller and this term would start disappearing so that is the background of that equation now you would ask me but what about this one Okay. You will see that in the textbook it's not there. Okay. The reason for that is that this equation is quite a complicated one. Complicated in the sense that the equations that needs to be solved needs to be solved numerically. Okay. So it's not that this has to be solved by using CFD. It is the equation that has to be solved numerically. And for that reason, because it is so complicated, it is not in your textbook, but it is available in literature. It's not an easy equation to work with. Okay, okay so take note of these values. For this one, we've got that equation in the textbook. And this actually, also this value that we've previously determined, that value is known as the Graz number. G or AETZ and that would be equal to 0 0.05 or 1 divided by 20. Okay. So the Graz number minus 1 is equal to x divided by d divided by Reynolds and Prandtl. And that is where the equation comes from from here of this length which is equal to 0 0.05 multiplied by Reynolds Prandtl multiplied by the diameter okay so that line would become flat when the Graz number is equal to 0 0.05 Okay, now something that is going to creep into the textbook and that you're going to see more and more is something that's going to confuse many of you. Okay. And that has to do with the fact that 
You have equations, but then suddenly there's more equations, and even more and more, and sometimes you don't know where to select from. Okay. So what it says is that there are special cases where the wall temperature in comparison with the bulk temperature is very, very large. Okay. So the difference between the surface and bulk is large. Large temperatures between the surface and the bulk. And then there is another equation that now suddenly pops up, which is called the Seder and Tate equation. And there's more than one Seder and Tate equation, but that is the 1936 one. And this equation says that the Nusselt number is now then equal to 1.86 multiplied by Reynolds, Prandtl, diameter, divided by L, and then we have this ratio of the bulk, temp the bulk viscosity to the surface one and everything to the 0.14. And that is equation 8.63 in your textbook of single and the jar. Okay. Now you as students, if you're going to have these equations, the question is going to be, but you know, when is it large? <laughs> When is the surface temperature difference large? So that I should take this, this equation into consideration. Again, there's no simple rule. You have to look at the equation. And one of the most important things that, that I have found for myself to evaluate that is just to look at that ratio. Okay. The ratio of that to the power of 0.14 and to see what effect it has on the equation. Okay. So, for example, let's suppose the viscosity bulk to viscosity surface. Okay. Okay. Let's suppose that ratio is equal to 0.9. The bulk viscosity to the surface viscosity. Okay, let me yeah, let me explain this also, just like that. Remember, we have flow through there, and there's the bulk temperature. Okay, and here is the surface temperature. Okay, so for this viscosity, that is the viscosity at that temperature. Okay, and this one would be the viscosity at the surface temperature. And because viscosity is a function of temperature, you can get the values from your tables. Okay. Now let's suppose this viscosity to that one is equal to 0.9. What do you think? Would that be a case of where there's a huge viscosity difference? Well, if you go and work it out, 0.9 to the 0.14, then that would be equal to 0.985. Okay. So we can see that it would change the equation by less than a percent. Okay. So that wouldn't be a case where the viscosity ratio is significant. Now let's start decreasing it to 0.5. If it is 0.5, then it would be 0.9. So now you're getting to about 10%. Okay. And if you go to 0.3, it would be equal to 0.04, 0.84. So now we're getting too close to about 20%. So depending on your application, you need to use your own judgment for this problem. But remember, this ratio excuse me, is not always smaller than one. It can also be the other way around. Because if we maybe have cooling and not heating, then the ratio can be more than one. So let's look at the case where the ratio is equal to 1.1. Then it would be an effect of 1.14 that it will, the influence it will have on the equation. And if it increases to 1.3, then it would be equal to 1.35. Okay, you understand? Okay. Let's do a simple, equa a simple example.
And in this example, I specifically want to concentrate a little bit on the problem that many of you have with properties. At what temperature should you calculate the properties? Okay. Okay. What we have here is water okay, at an inlet temperature of 20 degrees Celsius and a velocity of 0.1 meters per second. And it is given that the surface temperature is constant, it is equal to zero degrees Celsius. The tube diameter is 100 millimeters, and the length of the tube is 15 meters. Okay, 100 millimeters and 15, um, sorry, uh, 10 millimeters, not 100, 10 millimeters. The diameter 10 millimeters, 15 meter long tube. The wall temperature remains constant at zero degrees Celsius. Okay. Now, let's make an assumption. Okay. And the assumption that I'm going to make is to say, well, I'm going to assume that the bulk temperature is going to be about 10 degrees Celsius. I do not know yet what the outlet temperature is going to be, so I cannot just take the average. It's just a guess. Okay, 10 degrees Celsius, and I think many of you will say, but that's not unreasonable. We've got water coming in at 20, the wall temperature is zero. Okay, so the outlet temperature of the water cannot really be below zero, so it should be in anywhere in between. So let's choose 10 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now, at 10 degrees Celsius, if you look at table A9 in your textbook, where the properties of water is given, then the density is equal to 997.7 kilograms per cubic meter. The CP value is equal to 4194 joules per kilogram Kelvin. The K value is equal to 0 0.580 watts per meter Kelvin. The viscosity is equal to 1.307 multiplied by 10 to the minus 3 kilograms meters per second. And the Prandtl number is equal to 9.45. Okay, so at a temperature of 10 degrees Celsius, the density of the water, almost 1,000, 997.7, CP4194, K value 0 0.580, and the viscosity 1.307 multiplied by 10 to the 3, the primal number 9.45. Okay, before we start doing calculations, let's just calculate the mass flow right through the tube. The density multiplied by the area multiplied by the velocity. The mass flow rate is equal to the density multiplied by the cross-sectional area multiplied by the velocity. Okay, the density is equal to 997.7. The cross-sectional area is pi divided by 4 multiplied by 0 0.010 squared multiplied by the velocity, which is equal to 0.1. And that gives us a very small mass flow rate of 0.007839 kilograms per second. Okay, you all with me? Simple, easy? Right. Okay, everybody finish here? Because I'm going to clean it now. I'm going to give you a second or two or three more because I need some space. Uh, let me calculate the Reynolds number is equal to rho VD divided by the viscosity. Okay, and I'm not going to put in all the values. They are here. The density is there. Okay. The velocity is 0.1, the diameter is equal to 0.0, uh, 
uh, one zero and the viscosity there it is. Okay. So it is very elementary to calculate the, the Reynolds number as 118. The Reynolds number in a tube is 118. It means the flow is laminar flow. Okay. okay. Now, if we come back to this graph, okay, if we come back to the graph, we have the case of a constant wall temperature. Okay. So it's good news if we work in this region. Otherwise, we have to take that into consideration. Con into consideration, depending if the flow is fully developed or not. Okay, so let's just check it. We see that LH is equal to 0.05 multiplied by the Reynolds number multiplied by the diameter. Okay, if we calculate it, it is equal to 0.5589 meters, so about 600 millimeters. And LT would be equal to LH multiplied by the Prandtl number. And the Prandtl number is 9.45. So it would mean that it is equal to 3.42 meters. So if we now have this, if we try to draw it according to scale, okay. our tube length is 15 meters. Okay, it has been given as 15 meters. How long is it going to take before the flow is fully developed? Well, about 3 meters, okay. 3.42. So that is what is going to happen throughout the tube. And here, because it is a constant wall temperature, the temperature all around is zero, the Nusselt number must be equal to 3.66. You agree? Okay. okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the lazy approach. I'm going to say, ah, oh, well, this is negligible. <laughs> Let's assume everything is equal to 3.66, okay? I'm doing that. If you want to, you can go and calculate for the first 3.42 meters. You can go back to this equation and you can calculate the average Nusselt number for that part. You can calculate the heat transfer rate through this part and then you can do the rest of the tube 15 multi min minus 3.42 and use a Nusselt number of 3.42. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume the Nusselt number is equal to 3.66 and that would be valid from x equals 0 to x equals 15. So the total length of 15 meters. Okay. The previous lecture we've also discussed the importance of the NTUs, the number of transfer units. Because it says so much. Don't always just put it in the equation because then you just calculate the temperature but you do not realize what you're working with. So the NTUs is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area divided by the mass flow rate Cp. Okay. Okay, I have to go back quickly. I've got the Nusselt number. So the Nusselt number which is equal to 3.66 is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the diameter divided by k. 3.66 is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the diameter divided by the thermal conductivity. The diameter we have, 10 millimeters, the thermal conductivity has been given, so we can calculate the heat transfer coefficient as um, 212.3 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Okay, there's the heat transfer coefficient. Right, coming back to the NTUs, I've got the heat transfer coefficient. I have the surface area. 
surface area would just be equal to pi multiplied by the diameter multiplied by the length of the tube. The mass flow rate we've already calculated and the CP I have. So if I calculate the NTUs, I get a value of 3.044. So about 3. Okay. Previously we've seen that when you start having a heat exchanger with NTUs of 2.5, then it would be very effective. 3, obviously even more effective. 5 and more, you start wasting your money. Okay. So even before you do a calculation, what would you expect would the outlet water temperature be? You would expect that it's not going to be 19 or 18. You would expect that it would get quite close to the wall temperature because it's a very effective system. Okay. So now that we know that, we can calculate the outlet temperature is equal to Ts minus Ts minus Ti e to the minus NTUs. Where does the equation come from? We've derived it with the previous lecture and the lecture before that for the constant wall temperature case. The constant wall temperature case. Okay. And We've got the surface temperature, we've got the inlet temperature, we have the NTUs. Okay? So, can calculate the outlet temperature as equal to 0.953 degrees Celsius. So, very close to zero. Of course, the NTUs is large, more than about two and a half to three. Okay. Now, what confuses many students is that obviously, yes, now the outlet temperature is equal to 0.953, but I have selected a bulk temperature of 10. Remember, I've selected a bulk temperature of 10. Okay. So what we actually should do, okay, what we actually should do now is we should now say our new bulk temperature revised, okay must be the inlet temperature plus the outlet temperature divided by 2, which is equal to 10.47 degrees Celsius. Okay. And now we have to get the revised properties. Get the revised properties and go through the problem again until it converges. Question there at the back. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Well, that 10 plus um, 0 0.953. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, sorry, I see what I've done. Okay, so the question is about the 10. Uh, it's a writing error, yeah, of course. So it is, uh, we know it is 20. Our calculations show it is approximately 0.9. Okay. 0.9, so it's going to be 10.47, so it was just a writing error. Okay. So theoretically what we should do now is we have now a new bulk temperature, go back, we revise all the properties and go through the problem again. Okay. So that is what, you, what we should do. You do not have to do that in the tests and exams. Okay. So I'm going to spare you that. But let's suppose, let's suppose Let's suppose you've said that uh, this thing of you selecting a bulk temperature of 10, I do not buy it. Okay. And obviously at that stage you do not know the NTUs or anything like that. But let's suppose you said, no man, I want to choose a bulk temperature of 20, okay, which is not really realistic because you know the temperatures should decrease. But if you've done that, okay, then obviously you need the properties. You need to get the properties at 20 degrees Celsius. And don't do it as an exercise. If you now use that properties, then you'll get an outlet temperature of 0.86 degrees Celsius. Okay. So this one will tell you outlet temperature of about 1, and this one about 0.9. So you'll see it is not that sensitive in terms of your selection. But you can go and refine it and make it more accurate. There's a question there at the back. Um, sir, um, could we use the log temperature difference to get the new log 
Uh, no. Okay, very important. The question is, can we use the lock mean temperature difference for the bulk temperature? The answer is no. The reason for that is, uh, if I can draw my sketch again, uh, yesterday I've, I've done something very similar. So there is the surface temperature of zero. Okay. The temperature profile is going to do something like that from 20 to uh, 0.9. Okay. The bulk temperature is this. Okay. And you're right, obviously the temperature there is not equal to the bulk temperature. But in terms of how we normally define or derive all our equations and how it has been developed, to make it easier for you, we use always the properties at bulk. Okay. And not at another temperature, but at bulk. There are exceptions, and that is where you have to read the fine print of the equations. There are exceptions where it might be another temperature. It might be the film temperature, which would then be the average between the bulk and the surface again. Okay, so it depends. But remember, that temperature there is not the LMTD. So if you look at that difference, that is not the LMTD. Okay, we've done it yesterday. You can actually go and calculate that temperature, but it is not the LMTD. The LMTD is the integration of that to get a very, very good temperature difference between those two surfaces. And that is the function of the LMTD. Okay. Right. So, let me just see. Right. And now I've got another problem, another example. Okay. Uh, this example is based on the one in the textbook, but it's not the same. So in this example, we have um, an icy lake. Okay. Let's represent the lake like that. Okay. Uh, there's the water in the lake. Okay. And it's an icy lake. So there's lots of ice in it, and the result is that the surface temperature Ts is equal to zero degrees Celsius. Okay, so everywhere the tube temperature is equal to zero degrees Celsius. We are going to pump oil through it. Okay, the inlet temperature of the oil is 20 degrees Celsius. It's oil and the velocity of the oil is 2 meters per second. And the diameter of the tube, the tube diameter is 300 and the length of the tube is 200 meters. So 200 meters through underneath an icy lake, oil which has been pumped in a temperature 20, 2 meters per second, 300 diameter, length of 200 meters. And the question is, determine the outlet temperature. Determine the outlet temperature. <coughs> okay, everybody has a problem? Anything not clear? Okay, right. So, what I'm going to do now is, just to be silly, okay, <laughs> is to say, well, and that would sort of be the representation of saying, well, the bulk temperature is equal to uh, inlet temperature 20 plus outlet temperature minus 20 divided by 2. I suppose it can happen, no, it cannot really happen because the surface temperature is zero. Okay, but let me assume that, so that my bulk temperature is zero. Okay, so I assume a bulk temperature of zero. Okay. Now at that bulk temperature of zero, if you go to table A13, then you can get the, prop the following conditions for oil at zero degrees Celsius of a density which is equal to eight double nine kilograms per cubic meters 
thermal conductivity, which is equal to 0.1469 watts per meter Kelvin. Dynamic viscosity, kinematic viscosity, 4.242, multiplied by 10 to the minus 3 square meters per second. Cp is equal to 1797 joules per kilogram Kelvin. And the pronal number equal to 46. 0.636. Okay. While you write it down, I'm just going to clean the board on this side. Right, let's start with calculating the Reynolds number. Okay, the Reynolds number is equal to the velocity multiplied by the diameter divided by the kinematic viscosity. Okay, look at all the properties. Help me. The velocity is equal to two meters per second, it has been given. The diameter is 300 moles. The kinematic viscosity, there it is. So, very simple to calculate the Reynolds number, which is equal to 141.1. Conclusion, flow is laminar. We've got laminar flow. Okay. Therefore, we have to be careful of developing flow. Everything is not going to fully develop in 10 diameters like in turbulent flow. So let's calculate the thermal boundary length which is equal to 0 0.05 Reynolds Prandtl multiplied by the diameter. Okay, I didn't calculate, calculate LH. Why? Because the Prandtl number is larger than 1. So this is going to be the one that is going to determine if the flow is fully developed or not. Okay. So if we do that calculation, it is 98.94 uh, meters. Okay. 98 meters, almost 90 meters before the flow would be fully developed. So if we try to plot that on scale, our tube length is 200 meters, the pipe. Okay. So 90 meters is almost there. Okay. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, 99 meters, 98.94. That would be zero and that would be 200. Okay. So the thermal boundary layers would meet at that point there. Okay. Which therefore means that therefore means that if we look at the missile number, we have something like that. So a significant part of the flow is developing. Okay. So in this case, we cannot say that we can use the missile number for the constant wall temperature, which is equal to 3.66. It's not going to work in this case. We have to take into consideration the developing part. Right, and that long equation that I've written down for you, which is equal to 3.66 plus some terms, is now the equation that we need to use. Okay. 
And what was nice about that equation is that it is not only for that part, we can do it for that part, but we can j just as well do it for the whole length, and then everything is taken into consideration in the equation. Okay. So let me, let's do that. Let's do it here. Okay, so the equation is that the missile number is equal to 3.66 plus 0 0.065 uh, multiplied by D divide, divided by L multiplied by Reynolds Prandtl. Okay. And on the bottom part, we've got 1 plus also some more parts. I'm not going to put in all of that. But everything in the equation is D, L, Reynolds number and Prandtl number. Okay. So if we do the calculation, then the missile number works out as 0.4. Yes, Christopher. Uh, sorry, I have two questions. Uh, can it be 0.4 if it has to be larger than 3.66? Well, I've made a mistake in the calculation. Okay. <laughs> so, yes, thanks. Uh, I was hoping somebody pick it up. Uh, two reasons why it can't be. Obviously, if you look at the equation, 3.66, and if you look at the graph, okay, let's just go back to this graph. <laughs> For the case of a constant wall temperature, the missile number there is equal to 3.66. So if we do the calculation for the average missile number, it must be larger than 3.66. It's a very simple thing always to look at when you, do it, when you do calculations of an equation. Think about the answer. Does it really make sense? So that's the first reason why it can't be like that. But the second reason, I hope somebody else will remember. And that is that when we have convection, the missile number cannot be smaller than 1. Nusselt number equal to 1 but means conduction heat transfer. Okay, so that is not possible and it should be equal to 4.203. Okay, and we can see it is larger than 3.66. the second question, so that equation always gives the average already? Yes, okay. it gives you the average over the total length, so uh, you can, you can, uh, what you can do is you can only do it for this part, okay, and then obviously take that into consideration or in the equation you can actually take the whole length into consideration and it will give you the average. Okay. Right, so now from here we now do have the Nusselt number and the Nusselt number is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the diameter divided by the thermal conductivity. We have that, it's 4.203 we do have the diameter, we have the thermal conductivity. It is then very easy to go and calculate the heat transfer coefficient as equal to 2.058 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Okay. You can calculate the surface area, which is equal to pi d multiplied by L. Pi, and that would be equal to 188.5 square meters. While we're busy with areas, let's also calculate the cross-sectional area through which the oil flows, which would be equal to pi divided by 4 multiplied by d squared, and that would be equal to 0 0.07069 square meters. Now we can go and calculate the mass flow rate of the oil, which is equal to rho multiplied by the cross-sectional area multiplied by the average velocity. The velocity is 2 meters per second. We do have the density. We've calculated the cross-sectional area. So it is very easy to get the mass flow rate, which is 125.6 kilograms per second. Okay. 
the NTUs. Let's go and calculate the NTUs. Okay, the NTUs is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area divided by the mass flow rate and the CP. Everything is known. We've calculated the heat transfer coefficient. We do have the surface area for the heat transfer. We've calculated the mass flow rate and the CP is known from the properties. So the NTUs is equal to 0 0.001699. What does it tell you? <laughs> what does it tell you? <laughs> it's going to be very poor in heat transfer. Okay. So what do you expect is going to happen with your outlet temperature? <laughs> So the outlet temperature is not going to be close to zero. Okay, most probably it's going to be very close to in the inner temperature. <laughs> so let's, let's go and check it. Okay. So the outlet temperature is equal to the surface temperature minus the surface temperature minus the inner temperature e to the minus NTUs. Okay. You happy with that? The equation, we've derived it two lectures ago for a constant wall temperature. Okay. But the equation is in terms of E to the minus H area mass flow rate Cp. Okay, so rather do it in terms of NTUs. Right. Now, if we calculate the outlet temperature, it is equal to 19.97 degrees Celsius. Okay. So think about the problem again. Okay. Let's come back to the problem. Oil going in at 20, 200 meters, it's quite a long length, okay? And the surface temperature is zero. We would expect the temperature to decrease quite significantly. You remember I said, well, I'm going to choose a bulk temperature of zero, okay? And it's almost not even going to change. It's 19.97, and the reason is the NTUs is very, very low. Okay. Now, let's go and look at the LMTD. And with the LMTD, you know, I would encourage you to always make a sketch. Okay. We've got the wall, the surface temperature, which is at zero. Okay. The inlet temperature is 20, okay? And this temperature here of the oil is 19.97, okay? So if you just look at it, what do you expect this LMTD going to be, approximately? It's about 20, isn't it? <laughs> so if you go through the calculations and you get values larger than 20 or smaller than zero, you must know you've made a mistake. But just in terms of the discipline, let's go and calculate the LMTD. The LMTD is equal to that temperature difference, and that is equal to 20 minus zero, okay? Minus that temperature difference, which is 19.97, okay? Divided by the limb of those two terms. 20 minus 0 and 19.97 and fortunately it is equal to 19.98 degrees Celsius. And we are out of time, so thank you very much ladies and gentlemen.